May 3rd, 1999. A normal Monday evening in the Oklahoma suburbs. Families sitting down to dinner. Kids finishing up homework. People driving home from work. But above them, something impossible was forming. The atmosphere was breaking every rule in the meteorology textbook. In hours, a tornado would produce wind speeds of 321 miles per hour, the fastest winds ever recorded on Earth. Speeds so extreme that scientists thought their equipment was malfunctioning. This is the story of May 3rd, 1999, the day nature proved we knew nothing about its true power. That morning started like any spring day in Oklahoma. The Storm Prediction Center issued a routine outlook, just a slight risk of storms, Nothing unusual for early May in Tornado Alley, but meteorologists were missing something critical. Computer models disagreed on where storms would develop. A powerful jet stream was moving in from the west, but models had failed to detect it. By 7 a.m., weather balloons showed something alarming. Cape values, the measure of atmospheric instability, the raw energy available for storms, had climbed to 4,000 joules per kilogram. Think of it like a massive spring being compressed. 4,000 is extreme, the kind of number you see maybe once or twice a year, but it kept climbing. By mid-afternoon, Cape values exceeded 5,000 joules per kilogram, unheard of levels. The atmosphere over Oklahoma wasn't just unstable, it was a loaded gun. At 3.20 p.m., the first thunderstorm exploded over southwestern Oklahoma. Meteorologists knew better than to dismiss it. This storm was feeding on incredible atmospheric energy, Warm, humid air from the Gulf of Mexico was colliding with bone-dry air from the desert southwest. Above it all, powerful jet stream winds were creating massive wind shear, the difference in wind speed and direction that causes storms to rotate. By 4 p.m., the Storm Prediction Center realized they had drastically underestimated what was coming. At 4.30, they issued a tornado watch for western and central Oklahoma, 44 counties on alert, effective immediately until 10 p.m. Television stations interrupted programming. Meteorologists appeared on screen, voices urgent. This wasn't going to be ordinary. Families started paying attention to the sky, but nobody knew what was really coming because what was about to happen had never been recorded in human history. If you're fascinated by extreme weather stories like this one, subscribe to StormForge for more compelling natural disaster coverage every week. We dive deep into the most powerful storms in history, bringing you the science, the human stories, and the incredible footage that captured these moments. Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. Your subscription helps us continue researching and bringing you these incredible true stories of nature's power. Now, back to May 3rd, 1999, where the most violent tornado ever scientifically measured was about to touch down. At 6.23 p.m. Central Daylight Time, two miles south of Amber, Oklahoma, the tornado touched down. Within minutes, it was a monster. The funnel rapidly expanded, tracking northeast. Four miles into its path, it reached F4 intensity, winds between 207 and 260 miles per hour, strong enough to level homes, throw cars hundreds of feet, strip bark completely off trees, but it was just getting started. A team of scientists from the University of Oklahoma were racing to intercept it. They drove a specially equipped truck called a Doppler on wheels, or DAO. This mobile radar was designed to do something incredibly dangerous, get close to violent tornadoes and measure the winds inside them. They positioned near the tornado's path and aimed their radar at the strengthening vortex. What appeared on their screens seemed impossible. The radar detected winds of 301 miles per hour. Later, after reanalysis, that number was revised higher, 321 miles per hour, the fastest wind speed ever recorded on Earth. The scientists couldn't believe it. They checked their equipment multiple times. Was the radar malfunctioning? It wasn't. The tornado really was that powerful. At 6.35 p.m., the tornado reached Bridge Creek. What happened there defied everything scientists thought they knew. And uh, you folks in the path of this storm have time to get below ground. You need to be below ground with this storm. This is a deadly tornado. Winds exceeding 260 miles per hour, though we now know they were much higher. In Bridge Creek, approximately 200 homes and mobile homes stood in the path. They didn't just get damaged, they were granulated, pulverized into fragments so small you could barely tell what they had been. Entire homes were swept completely off their foundations, leaving nothing but bare slabs, not a wall, not a piece of furniture, nothing. The trees told their own horrific story. They weren't just broken, they were completely stripped of bark, standing like white telephone poles. The ground itself was scoured. 
the tornado tore up the earth, leaving deep grooves in the soil. Vehicles were thrown like toys. One pickup truck was found wrapped around the telephone pole, metal twisted as if put through an industrial compactor. The tornado even scraped about one inch of asphalt off roads. Twelve people lost their lives in Bridge Creek. Nine were in mobile homes, which stood no chance against these winds. The deaths were concentrated in the Willow Lake and Southern Hills editions and Bridge Creek estates. The physics exceeded anything in textbooks. This wasn't weather anymore. It was a grinder, a force that didn't damage structures. It erased them from existence, and it was heading straight for the Oklahoma City suburbs. At 6.57 p.m., meteorologist David Andra at the National Weather Service was watching his radar with growing horror. He could see a massive debris ball, the telltale signature of a tornado, carrying tons of material high into the air, and he could see where it was going. Moore, Oklahoma, a city of 40,000 people. Standard warnings didn't feel adequate. This was unprecedented. So David Andra did something never done before. He issued the first ever tornado emergency. The warning read, this is an extremely dangerous and life-threatening situation. If you are in the path of this large and destructive tornado, take cover immediately. Television meteorologists broadcast continuous coverage. Helicopter cameras captured footage, though it was difficult to see clearly because it was wrapped in rain and debris. What viewers saw was a dark, churning wall of destruction moving northeast toward heavily populated areas. On Interstate 35, traffic came to a standstill. People evacuated, fleeing the tornado's path. But some made a fatal decision. They abandoned cars and ran for highway overpasses, thinking the concrete would protect them. For years, a myth had circulated that overpasses were safe shelter. This came from a 1991 video where people sheltered under an overpass and survived. But that was pure luck. Weak tornado. Didn't directly hit. Unique design. This was different. This was F5. And what happened at those overpasses would finally kill that dangerous myth forever. When tornado winds blow through an overpass, the Venturi effect occurs. The confined space acts like a wind tunnel. Instead of protecting you, the overpass accelerates the wind and all that debris gets channeled directly through that narrow space. At one overpass along Interstate 44, a woman evacuated her car with her husband and two children. The car had stalled. They climbed the embankment, seeking shelter. As the tornado passed, the accelerated winds ripped the woman away from her family. She did not survive. Her 11-year-old son survived, having held on to the steel girders with everything he had. At another location, a highway sign turned missile sliced into a man's leg. The injury was catastrophic. Three overpasses were directly struck. There were fatalities at all three. The myth died on May 3rd, 1999. They're not shelters, they're death traps. But some people did everything right. At Westmore High School, an honor ceremony was happening in the auditorium. About 400 students and parents were there. When the tornado emergency was issued, officials evacuated everyone immediately. They moved all 400 people into interior hallways and bathrooms, away from windows and exterior walls. The tornado passed directly over Westmore High. Damage was severe. Cars were picked up and thrown through walls, some completely destroyed. The building sustained heavy damage, but not a single person inside was injured because they had warning and took proper shelter. Those 400 people should have died, but they didn't. The warnings worked. Meanwhile, the tornado was tearing into the heart of Moore. At 7.10 p.m., the tornado crossed into Moore. It hit Country Place Estates at full F5 intensity. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Mike. 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 Uh, you got to look at this. this. This is phenomenal. It's gone. The neighborhood is gone. It's level. There's nothing here. I mean, it's incredible. The tornado moved into Greenbrier Eastlake Estates. Entire rows of homes reduced to rubble. In one section, four homes side by side were completely obliterated. Only concrete slabs remained. This damage received the F5 rating, trees completely stripped of bark. At Emerald Springs Apartments, a two-story building was mostly flattened. Three people lost their lives there. Across more, 11 people perished. 293 were injured. Damage in Cleveland County alone reached $450 million. By 7.30 p.m., the tornado crossed into Oklahoma County, striking industrial southeastern Oklahoma City. This is where one of the most incredible pieces of evidence emerged. A freight railroad car weighing 36,000 pounds, 18 tons, 
was picked up and thrown three quarters of a mile, but it didn't just slide. It bounced like a basketball. Witnesses reported the massive car staying airborne for 50 to 100 yards at a time, crashing back to earth, then being lofted again. Multiple homes were destroyed in southeast Oklahoma City. Two people lost their lives when a trucking company building disintegrated. The tornado moved into Dell City, striking the Dell Air Housing Edition. Hundreds of homes damaged or destroyed. Families huddled in closets and bathrooms as homes were torn apart. Some survived. Six people didn't. By now, the tornado had been on the ground over an hour. It had traveled more than 30 miles, and it wasn't finished. It crossed Sooner Road into Midwest City, damaging Tinker Air Force Base. Then it moved into a business district along Interstate 40. At Hudeberg Auto Group, 800 vehicles were damaged or destroyed. Dozens of cars were thrown completely across Interstate 40. Some weighed thousands of pounds. They sailed through the air, crashing into motels on the other side. A school bus, fortunately empty, was thrown across the interstate. Multiple hotels and businesses were destroyed. Hampton Inn, Comfort Inn, and several others reduced to rubble. Between Southeast 15th and Reno Avenue, the tornado struck one final residential area. Three more people lost their lives. And then, at 7.48 p.m., after one hour and 25 minutes on the ground, after traveling 38 miles, after claiming 36 lives, the tornado lifted. It dissipated just south of Midwest City. The monster was gone. But behind it, a 38-mile scar stretched across central Oklahoma. As the storm moved away, eerie silence fell. Survivors emerged from shelters to find a world fundamentally altered. In some neighborhoods, nothing was left, just empty concrete slabs stretching in rows where homes had stood. Debris was everywhere, but also missing. Some items were found 90 miles away. Search and rescue began immediately. 13 people were missing. Urban search and rescue teams deployed from across the country with specially trained dogs. The final toll was staggering. 583 people injured, only counting those who went to hospitals. 36 people perished directly from the storm. Another five died from indirect causes. The trauma was so severe that one survivor, physically uninjured, later tragically ended their own life, unable to cope with the loss. Property damage was catastrophic. More than 8,000 homes damaged or destroyed, over 1,000 apartments, 260 businesses, 11 public buildings, seven churches. Total damage, $1.2 billion. The first tornado in history to cause over $1 billion in damage. The next morning, President Bill Clinton signed a major disaster declaration. Federal Emergency Management Agency teams deployed. The American Red Cross opened 10 shelters, housing 1,600 people who had lost their homes. Nearly 1,000 Oklahoma National Guard members were mobilized. The Army Corps of Engineers estimated 500,000 cubic yards of debris to be cleared. Weeks of work. This is the most devastating tornado I have ever seen. I have never seen so much complete destruction of homes over so wide an area. And of course, you know that uh, at least uh, for a couple of communities, the measurement of the tornado was virtually off the charts. In the months and years following May 3, 1999, the Bridge Creek Moore tornado fundamentally changed tornado science and safety. The mobile Doppler radar data proved genuine. The 321 mile per hour wind measurement was verified. This was a watershed moment. It proved tornadoes could produce winds far exceeding what the Fujita scale could account for. This storm led to the development of the enhanced Fujita scale in 2007. The tornado emergency warning became standard protocol. Now, when a violent tornado threatens a populated area, meteorologists have the language to convey extreme danger. It's been used many times since and has saved countless lives. Investment in mobile Doppler radar increased dramatically. More units were deployed. Radar coverage improved the cross tornado alley. But perhaps the most important legacy was what happened in Oklahoma communities. Oklahoma launched a massive storm shelter initiative, a $12 million project to build safe rooms across the Oklahoma City metro. By 2003, 6,016 storm shelters had been constructed. Building codes were strengthened. New homes required proper anchoring. Garage doors, identified as a major failure point, were required to be more robust. 
The test came on May 8, 2003. Another major outbreak occurred. An F4 tornado took a path through Moore remarkably similar to 1999. It crossed almost the same neighborhoods. This time, zero people lost their lives. The shelters worked. The warnings worked. The community was prepared. Then, on May 20th, 2013, tragedy struck Moore again. An EF5 tornado tore through the heart of the city. 24 people lost their lives. Each loss, a terrible tragedy. But that number could have been hundreds. The lessons from 1999, the shelters built, the warning systems improved, the community awareness, all combined to minimize casualties. And the overpass myth finally died. After the three deaths at overpasses on May 3rd, 1999, the National Weather Service launched an aggressive education campaign. Meteorologists made it clear, overpasses are never safe shelter. Stay in your car and drive at a right angle away from the tornado or lie flat in the ditch, but never an overpass. May 3rd, 1999 was a wake-up call. For decades, scientists thought they understood tornadoes. They thought they knew the limits of what the atmosphere could produce. The Bridge Creek Moore tornado proved they were wrong. 321 mile per hour winds. Nobody thought that was possible. But the tornado didn't care about our models or theories. It did what nature is capable of doing. The atmosphere, when conditions align, can create forces beyond our imagination. We've learned so much since that day. Our radar is better. Our warnings are better. Our buildings are stronger. Our shelters are safer. But we can never be completely safe. The sky will always be more powerful than anything humans can build. All we can do is respect that power, prepare for it, and remember the 36 people who lost their lives on May 3rd, 1999. Because their deaths taught us lessons that have saved hundreds since. The scar across Oklahoma is fading. Trees have grown back. Homes have been rebuilt. But the memory remains. F5 isn't just a rating on a scale. It's a reminder of our fragility. A reminder that for all our scientific progress, for all our technology and understanding, we are still small beneath the power of nature. The Bridge Creek Moore tornado was the strongest tornado ever scientifically measured. And while we hope we never see its equal again, we know that somewhere, someday, the atmosphere might prove us wrong once more. That's why we watch the sky. That's why we study the storms. And that's why we never forget May 3rd, 1999. Thank you for watching this Stormforge documentary. If this story moved you, please share it. Subscribe for more true stories of nature's incredible power and stay safe out there.